go again. Hi, my name is Dr. Derek Lee. It's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Chalar Yilgore, who is an associate professor at the Anna Pediatric Adult and Spinal Disorders Surgeon at the Comprehensive Spine Center at Asabadam Mas Masalak Hospital, uh, Asabadam University School of Medicine, Department of Orthopedics and Traumatology, and he's also the director of the Spine Fellowship Program. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Derek, for the invitation and this great opportunity. Oh, it's my pleasure. Now, it's actually about two years ago, in about two weeks, that I spoken to your associate, Dr. Ahmed uh, Alani. Yeah. And it was my first, very first interview for this uh, scoliosis channel. And I know in VBT, things have evolved rapidly over the last two years in terms of parameters, instrumentation, technique. And there's been much more research that's been published on the topic as well. I was wondering, can you uh, walk me through the process of how you currently determine which scoliosis cases are appropriate for VBT? Yeah, sure. So I'll just, you know, start with a very, you know, wide answer while I'm also sharing the screen. Is that, I guess the answer to that is, you know, everybody and nobody <laughs> is appropriate to VBT. So I think it's a, a very, you know, patient specific, you know, technique to choose because it depends on many, many things. It depends on the remaining growth. It depends on the flexibility. It depends on the curve location. And it depends on actually what the patient really wants to do with her or his spine after the surgery. So, it's not really that, you know, we can just say that, okay, this is a very good candidate and this is not a very good candidate. But what we can do is actually group the patients according to their remaining growth to better understand, you know, uh, to better answer this question. Why is that so? It's because as we know in a very um, general way of saying is VBT is a growth modulation technique. So we want to modulate, we want to change the way the patient grows with the remaining growth that he or she has. So this is why, you know, we base our patient selection and correction strategy today according to the anticipation of the remaining growth. And how we do that is through, I, I, I'll try to, you know, explain it through this uh, paper that we have published. So this is VBT and what happens to the follow-up spontaneous curve behavior, you know, after we do the implementation. And what we did in this study was, we grouped the patients into five main categories according to where they are, you know, in their growth curve. So the Sanders one, very below here, as you can see in, the, uh, in this line, is the ones that are really, really early. They are juvenile, still Sanders one. And then we go to Sanders 2, which are pre-adolescent, and then Sanders 3, early adolescent, and late adolescent and early mature. So let me first try to explain what this big graph here tries to show, and then I'll try to walk you, walk you through some of the cases. So here, what we think is, so preoperatively, you have a curve magnitude. It might be 50, it might be 60, it might be 30, whatever, and then you have a flexibility. And then postoperatively, actually, you know, the magnitude of curve you will get is based on what the surgeon does in the surgery. So you can correct more or you can correct less. So what we did with this analysis was to get rid of the effect of the, of the pre-op. And in the first direct, we had different magnitudes of curve. So what we did was we, you know, added or subtracted so that we make all of the you know first directs at the same you know point and after that after the first direct this is what goes on six weeks three months six months one year 18 months two years and three years so if in a way that you know first direct was like time zero then what's going on after that and as you can see here if you are sender six or seven as an early mature Actually, you know, first direct until two years is not a very big change in average. And this shows the, the confidence interval. And then Sanders four and five, 
they have a little bit more growth, so they would modulate a little bit uh, on average 6.5 degrees. Sanders trees would modulate a little bit more around 11 degrees. Sanders twos would modulate up to 30 degrees almost. And then Sanders one would modulate 45 degrees and also probably beyond that because this was very few patients in this group. And what we did was a release of the tether. So probably if we didn't, it would keep on, you know, growing to the other side. And down below here, what it shows us is that the first graph here is the pulmonary complications, which are pretty much similar among the groups. This is mechanical complications. The younger the patient, the more the mechanical complications. And this is the overcorrection, younger the patient, more overcorrection. So this shows that you know pulmonary functions are pretty much the same, but what's happening in mechanical point of view is more prominent in the in the earlier Sanders groups. And we don't just base you know the remaining growth of Sanders. We look at other things, you know, paternal height, the kid's height, menarche, and all those other stuff that you know show us the skeletal maturity. But this is a, a proxy of you know uh, what we can use in general. So before going into uh, some patient examples, you have any questions around there or something that we should you know focus on more? Oh sure. Have you uh, narrowed down basically a bit of a, a range or sweet spot where you like tether? Do you prefer uh, you know what are your optimal parameters in terms of age? Is it Sanders three four? Sanders three four or five? Yeah, so actually, you know, this was something that I was going to show after the patient examples, but within this uh, article, you know, this is what we are recommending at this point is that if you are Sanders one, we are expecting, you know, to do a lot of overgrowth and almost, you know, mechanical complications and reoperation might be inevitable. So, so for Sanders 1K patients, what we, you know, suggest is to wait, you know, use braces, use other techniques and try to buy some time as much as you can. And for Sanders 2, actually we do a different strategy. Again, with Sanders 1, the, the similar strategy can apply. If you can wait, try to wait, buy some, buy some time. But if not, what we do is then we adjust our correction. We correct less. So we try to allow more space for the remaining growth. So Sanders tree, as you have said, is like the sweet spot is probably the best candidates because the, there is enough you know, uh, growth to release the stresses on the tether, but there is not so much growth to cause all these mechanical problems. So Sanders tree might be a sweet spot, Sanders four and five, so they are now growing less and less. So we don't know if the growth, the modulation is enough. So if in long run the tether breaks, we don't know if this is going to be a durable construct or not. And then again, for Sanders six and seven, we need longer and longer follow-up to determine if this you know, limited growth that they have is enough for long-term durability. If you go back to the previous uh, graphic, now it, the graph basically looks at change in pop angle after it correlates with uh, what you expect with um, bone growth modulation. Yeah. Right. Okay. And how does flexibility factor into this as well? So I think, you know, how it affects is so let's. Imagine we have two patients, both are, you know, 60 degrees to start with. And then one can bend, bend down to 20 and the other can bend down to 35. So one is more flexible and the other is less flexible. And if you correct both of these patients down to 20 in the surgery, it means that, you know, the forces you apply are different because the first one is more flexible with less force. You can, you can achieve that. But in the other case, you should apply, you know, more forces, which means the tether is going to be tighter. So this is obviously going to affect the remaining curve behavior. 
and so this is why you know you see this very wide you know uh, confidence intervals with all these you know calculations because this is not just how much you grow this is about where you start did you start off with 50 degrees or did you start off with 70 degrees or how much flexible you were or how much forces i applied so if we can you know get all these different information from all these points then we can of course get a better you know prediction but other than that just by looking at the remaining growth this is this is how much you know preci precision we can get in terms of uh, flexibility again is there a sweet spot as a you know sanders 3 is kind of a sweet spot for is a sweet spot for um a tethering what kind of flexibility do you like to bend down to get the best uh, outcomes so this is i think a very you know empirical thing still people say that it should bend down to 30 is it true or is it not you know we don't really know but i think it also depends on why is the patient not flexible so if the patient is not flexible because of you know already ankylosed facet joints or some you know some disc changes disc degeneration in the uh, mri already preoperatively then this might be a no go it not not because it doesn't bend down to 30 degrees but because of the mentality why it doesn't bend there but um, so i think it also again depends on the initial curve so if you are operating on a 50 degree curve i want it to bend down less than 20 because you know even bending down to 30 in that case is not enough because you start off with 50 so i think these are very uh, individualized you know uh, things we should also see in clinics you know the change it depends on the hump as well uh, but still you know i think all of this ends again on what the patient is you know preferring to do because if you don't have too much flexibility and if i don't you know try to overemphasize correction in the surgery and you end up with a i don't know 10 20 30 degrees curve at the end and if you are okay if you are not you know willing to go to zero degrees then it might still work for you so you know this is by talking to the patient and understanding the needs of each individual i think you know we can find a workaround uh, for these kind of stuffs so let me also try to walk you through you what i'll try to do is go from sanders one until Sanders seven, you know, a case example for each. And actually I'll do Sanders three in two, two different parts, Sanders three A and B. And then, so in eight case examples, try to show you, you know, how we are currently approaching these different, you know, uh, Sanders groups. So let's start with Sanders one. So this is pre-menarche nine years old. So this is one of our very, very early cases. This is, you know, something that we don't uh, do uh, more recently. Try ready it open, research zero, but it was 60 degree curve. So back then we thought she'll grow a lot, which means she will modulate a lot, which we thought was a good thing back then. But actually, you know, what happened in two years was she already overcorrected. So we started off with a 25 degrees in the first direct, and it was almost minus 25 degrees in two years. So at this point, you know, we discussed on, should we release the tether? Should we replace the tether? Uh, or should we remove the tether? And back then our decision was to remove the tether and we removed it. And six weeks later, it looked, you know, pretty good. We were pretty much happy. So it bounced back a little that overcorrection here was slightly released, so we were happy. But then comes the follow-up. She grows the curve again. So here we were, you know, three and a half years after the initial surgery. So she had two surgeries now. She had the implementation and she had the removal as well. But we kept the screws because we thought, you know, we might go on and do another tether. But now, you know, three and a half years later, she is now 19 centimeters you know, grown in height. And actually she has a bigger curve than where she started. 
So what we ended up doing for this patient was, uh, was a posterior spinal fusion. Uh, and she has grown more after that, some, some growth due to curve correction and some due to, you know, growth. But this is, you know, what we ended up doing for her, you know, with 23 centimeters of growth <laughs> over almost the four, four and a half years of period. And uh, so this is for Sanders one, what we think for now is buy some time, do braces, you know, try to postpone as much as possible because the mechanical complications with BBT is almost inevitable. So let's go to Sanders too. So this is one of the later cases now, not, not very recent, but not one of the very, you know, first uh, couple of cases. So we tried for brace for almost two years with this patient. She was okay in the beginning, but then she started not to use the brace. Then she did again, then she didn't. So, and then it, at one point she was like, you know, I am never going to wear the brace again or something like that. But she was Sanders too, but triread it was still open and the curve was not too big. So maybe today we could have waited more on this patient. But back then we told them about the VBT and they agreed on doing that. But our strategy on the initial correction was a little bit different this time. So what we did was we didn't really correct too much. So the pre-op and the first direct, as you can see here, are pretty much you know the same in magnitude of the curve. Because we wanted to have the remaining growth you know, do the job instead of, you know, initially correcting in the surgery. So this is up to three years. And then what do you think is going to happen now? I'm going to show you five years afterwards. Some overcorrection? Overcorrection, but she's Sanders five. Okay. So what's the next option? <laughs> if not overcorrected, then what we get? We get tether breakage. Mm. So in this patient, actually, we got some tether breakage and slightly more, you know, curve again. But now she's under seven, probably, hopefully, this is a stable construct afterwards. We'll see. So this is a very recent photo of her. And we'll see what's going to happen in eight years and 10 years. But she looks pretty good. She's happy because she's, she didn't wear a brace. Uh, but, um, so, but still, this is a surgery. But we tried to, you know, uh, after knowing this, how much you know you would modulate? Mm -hmm. We tried to adjust the initial correction to get you know uh, to do this to this final result. So let's go to Sanders three now. So Sanders three with a tri ready it open. So she used the brace for one and a half years, but now here we were at fifty degrees. So again, you know, we did less correction on the on the table because she's a very early Sanders tree. She's almost Sanders two, but she just crossed Sanders tree, tried it, it's still open. So we expect too much growth. So here we correct down to 40 and then it modulates down to 12 when she is Sanders seven. So pretty good, you know, uh, initial correction strategy for this patient. So let's go to Sanders three B. So now we are getting less and less growth remaining with the tri it closed, but still this patient is expected to grow. So what we did was we corrected a little bit more down to 27, but the thing was actually in many of the cases, what we see is when we correct one curve, the other curve also, you know, corrects spontaneously. But for this specific patient, this wasn't the case. The lumbar curve didn't, you know, have a good response to the correction above. So this was why we braced her for a couple of, you know, uh, months in the beginning uh, until we were sure that, you know, the, the modulation started. And then this was, you know, how we ended up doing with this patient uh, in, in three years. Uh, and she's already mature at Sanders 8. And then this is, you know, two years more. So it all looks stable. And we'll see, you know, what's going to happen in the long run as well. So now let's go to Sanders 4. Of course, the triad is, is already closed now, but still pre anarchy So there is some growth, but not too much. So we corrected down to 19. And then she ended up 16. So pretty much, you know, 
uh, same results of you know what we get in the beginning was the the final results at three years. So now we go to Sanders five. Now the patient is also post menarche. So here is an example that it goes up to two and a half years. It was pretty stable up to two years, and then it started to you know slightly increase because of two tether breakages. But then actually at three years it was stable until the fourth year, but we'll see if more levels are going to break and this is going to grow more curve, or if it's going to be stable, you know, only time will show. So let's go to Sanders 6. Uh, so in this case, what we did was actually, we did, you know, tether both curves. So because, you know, she didn't have too much growth left, we, we weren't sure whether the, you know, lower curve was going to respond or not. So we operated on both curves and for three years, it was pretty stable. But from year two to year three, you can see the increase in the lumbar curve. And we had a CT and show that, you know, there were two levels of, you know, breakages in this patient that it got, you know, uh, some loss of correction. So then, you know, I like, I'll show you more follow-up, but still let me ask you, you know, what do you think is going to happen after this? The, it was five degrees for two years. Now it's 12. And we confirmed with the CT that we have two levels of breakage. So what's next? Well, it's pretty balanced. And I would take, uh, you know, 12 and 14 any day. Did it, was it stable? Well, actually, she decided to do some exercises. She started back on short exercises. And what happened for her in the upcoming year was that she almost slightly looked even better. So, um, and this is a Sander 6 patient to start with, right? So we didn't have too much, you know, modulation of the growth, but maybe there is also some, you know, soft tissue remodeling, we don't know, that if we can keep them for two or three years, that it might be stable, but, you know, this is only four years. Right, she's only 16, 17 now. What's going to happen when she's 30, 40? So we'll see uh, in the long run, you know, how this will turn out to be, but at least for this patient, still it looks good, even though there were two levels of breakages. Can I ask you a question, Dr. Ilgor? Yeah, sure, sure. Do you have a sense in terms of um, how, when you're going to the later maturity, you know, standard seven, and uh, Sanders eight. Um, how long do you think a tether has to hold before you see enough soft tissue modulation? You don't know. Or I don't know. This is a very tough question. <laughs> so I really don't know because, you know, I think it also depends on the preoperative condition of the patient. You know, if you just, you know, diagnose the patient day one and do the surgery, it might be something different. But if you diagnose, do the bracing, do the exercises, and the patient knows, you know, how to control the midline and everything. And then you do the surgery, then it might be different. So again, you know, I think this is also a very individual thing. Mm. I just cannot say that if, if it holds for two years, then you are fine or something like that. But I think there are many factors that are affecting to it. So let's go to Sanders 7. I think this is the last case example we have is, uh, Again, a, a 51 degree curve, Sander 7, post menarche, and we do the surgery, and then it's you know uh, pretty stable for one year. And then what this patient also th thought was, we were thinking that this was nice, but she was saying that, you know, I want to do more, I want to achieve more. And she was asking how I can do that. And we were like, you know, well, you don't have too much growth left and this is a growth modulation technique so probably this is your end result but again like the previous patient she said i want to try something and the only thing that we could offer her was short exercise because she already has vbt she's not a good candidate for uh for brace right so we said why don't you go in and do some exercises and then this is her after one year in two years and three years so I think, you know, there is still some growth remaining in Sander 6 and 7 patients. It's not like they are Sander's 8. And when they are 
not you know two three five four years after post monarchy probably there is still some things that we can change and some of that can be just positioning maybe that this is just her muscle strength that she is holding maybe if she doesn't do the exercises for two years then she'll go back to this so this is probably not real you know change in the curve size but she is just able to you know maintain a more stable posture she is not just you know letting the gravity take over her so probably this is just you know same curve same magnitude but we are just measuring a little bit different in cope because of how she you know postures herself it's a follow-up question have you noticed um any correlation between patients who have done um, scoliosis specific uh, exercises like Schroff post surgery in terms of um, you know better overall corrections, more stability, less other breaks, that type of thing, or is it too variable? Yeah, still, still we don't know, but we try to go for preoperative and postoperative scoliosis specific exercise in almost all of the cases. And uh, many of our cases are also, you know, they have used braced sometime in their, you know, uh, journey. Sometimes they are just, you know, they just come to us with 65 degrees right away. Then it's a different story. But uh, for most of the cases, it's a, it's a combination of all these techniques. Now, you're one of the few centers that actually goes, you know, beginning with, uh, Physiotherapy before um, monitor, you know, bracing as well if you need to. Everything is yeah. all in one, which is pretty rare. Yeah. Um, did you basically organize your center that way? I assume you did for optimal results because of everything you put together in your past, right? Yeah, this is also for adults as well, right? So, so our center is a combined adult and pediatric. And it's also combined in sense of, you know, uh, non-operative treatment and operative treatment as well. And also algological, you know, pain related treatment. So this is all in one center because, you know, otherwise one, another colleague does something else and you do something else. And then if you don't have all these in the same toolbox, sometimes it's hard for you to switch between one treatment and the other. Because like, you know, if you start with, let's say bracing or or scoliosis specific exercises and you don't do surgery this is the only thing that you do and with time you might get some results which are good but not perfect you might you know you might be a point that you might switch to a you know a, a, another growth modulation technique which is stronger but if you are not doing that then you know it might be a no go for you but on the other way around if you are just doing vbt then uh, like one of the, some of the cases that i've shown you some of our earlier cases we operated on 41 degrees 42 degrees 45 degrees right because back then you know this was very new but nowadays we try to you know preserve this technique to you know bigger curves and do you know bracing to to the others and stuff like this so when you have all the, the all the toolbox then it gives you more flexibility between you know choosing the initial treatment and also changing the treatment throughout the process i think it's a so yeah it's a great yeah, please system. go ahead i <laughs> think uh, all centers should basically be like this because you treating them throughout the full spectrum of their journey mm -hmm. and you can step in when you need to in terms of you know if there's quick curve progression then you can uh, bring in, add other tools as, as required as well. Sorry to cut so you off. I don't, thank you. So I don't have a, like a scientific evidence right now, published or unpublished, which I can say that, you know, in these patients that we have done bracing post-op or Schrott post-op, that, uh, that the results are better or worse or whatever, or the same. But we are keeping the data and hopefully it will come soon that we will show whether the changes that we are having is due to the change in the, you know, the VBT itself, or are we actually really doing something with the addition of this, you know, post-operative bracing and exercises? I don't really know the answer yet, but hopefully we'll know soon. 
So I will show you one last uh, extreme example. So this is an 82 degree girl. Um, and this is a patient who is growth hormone deficient. And they are willing to start her on growth hormone. And as you know, even if you don't have scoliosis, when you start on growth hormone, you might grow scoliosis. So actually, you know, they uh, they were very concerned about whether they should really start on growth mod, uh, hormone or not. But one thing was what her mother was saying that the curve was not that big just a couple of months ago. So it was like a very recent progression to this magnitude. Maybe it was, I don't know, 50, 60 degrees slightly before. We don't have previous X-rays. But the mother was, you know, saying that, you know, this was, you know, very early. And what made us confirm that was how flexible she was. So depending on the preoperative, you know, cob and vertebras, she bended down to 24. But actually, if you just measure the actual curve within, it's down to 35. And now that she was going to go on growth hormone, we said, this might be a good candidate. And so this is what we did. We corrected 82 down to 36. And now she's down to 20. And we'll see, you know, what's going to happen in the long run. But we are also, you know, uh, this was an example I wanted to show as a, like an extreme case. So this is not every day practice that we do 80 degree curve but this is something that possibly can be done if you know a, this uh, individual patient is based on the remaining growth based on the flexibility is allowing you you know to do that i think this can be also done uh, as a case example so these are the things that i wanted to show you as as in the first question regarding the patient selection and correction strategy that we currently have. Oh, that was beautiful. Thank you very much for putting that together. Now, because you're sharing your screen, I can't access my uh, questions. <laughs> Should I stop that? Okay. Or, okay, and I'll just ask it and we'll reshare it, okay. Bam. So let me also have some. Sure. I'll drink. Okay. So now the next part is, I think, the discs. Did you want to touch on uh, what are your parameters for tethering uh, more mature spines? Or do you tether <laughs> above uh, Sanders 7, if you know we, what I mean? We haven't done any cases above Sanders 7 yet. Okay. Um, so we don't have any experience with Sanders 8. So like, you know, absolute no growth. Yes. Yeah, we don't know. Because Sanders 7 still... There is also a very recent uh, publication, which was curves around 40, Sanders 7, and they, they were even getting no treatment or they were weaned off the brace because now that they are Sanders 7, Reser 5 or stuff like that. Or they were said that, you know, this is a, this is a mid thoracic, you know, 40 degrees curve, it might be stable. And then they followed up for, I don't remember the follow-up, it was two or three years, but the final magnitude of the average COP was 51. So even when they are Sanders 7, they had 11 degrees on average progression. So this is also showing that if it can go worse, probably it can go better as well, right? Uh, so this is why we still pursue Sanders 6s and 7s. Mm -hmm. It's although we don't see too much modulation in the image we still think that at least in some cases i don't know for how long but if the tether holds there might be something that we are changing there some remodeling whatever it is absolutely but uh sanders 8 we haven't done any yet okay dr yogar i know your uh center is very concerned about disc health and the possibility of perhaps uh just got a fusion because i know with tethering especially with uh, lateral bending flexibility, there is reduction in, in movement at the tethered discs. Um, your recent research uh, indicates that at two years post tethering, that this looks pretty healthy as verified by MRI. Can you talk a little bit more about, uh, about that experience? Yeah. So since day one, yes, we are talking about uh, 
growth modulation technique, but also, you know, in a sense, this is a non-fusion surgery, right? So what we are willing to show, whether it is correct or not, whether this is really non-fusion or at the end, it will go to autofusion uh, or not. So the, whatever the answer is, it's not important. If it autofuses, maybe it's good because it will, at the end, maybe have less tether breakage. I don't know. Maybe if it doesn't, it's good because you want to have flexibility and you have it for long term. So I don't know which answer is good, but I just want to know what is the answer. So we are just, you know, keeping on the data pre-op at two years. And now we are doing the similar study at five years. And the next step is to do it in 10 years again. So we keep on following all these patients uh, according to their, you know, uh, disc status and actually also facet joint status as well. So the, the study that you have been, you know, uh, talking about that you were talking about is that this study, only 25 patients to start with, uh, mean age was 12 and mean Sanders was three. So the, the follow-up was almost two and a half years. And we looked for all the adjacent levels and all the intermediate levels. So for these 25 patients, it ended up being a total of 217 levels of discs and facet joints bilaterally, which we evaluated. And we found no degenerative findings in 99.3% of the facets and 977 of the discs. So there were some cases with slight degenerations and I'll show you which cases they were. But for, the, for all the others, everything looked fine at two years or, or let's say two and a half years. So let's see which were the cases that had problems. So on this side, we look at the discs. So for 23 cases, discs were perfect to start with, discs were perfect to end with. For one case, discs were degenerated pre-op and they were at the, at the same level of degeneration at the end. But for one case, we started off with some moderate degeneration, and then it increased in the scoring of the degeneration. So it degenerated a little bit further, but no cases with uh, no degeneration at the end have degenerated in this case series. There was only one that deteriorated, not a, you know, a new onset degeneration. But on the facet side, actually, so for 23, again, everything was perfect for one case, there were pre-app and post-op, you know, similar degeneration. But for this one case, there was a new onset degeneration, which was, you know, level two. But actually, this was a what we call a 1A R curve in Lenke classification, which means it's a very long C curve. And in this patient, we stopped a little short. So we stopped at T12 as we would in other, you know, 1A, 1B, 1C curves. But actually the curve was one AR. So this was probably some, you know, uh, selection of level or, you know, the instrumented level selection uh, change. The change was due to that, I believe, uh, because the degeneration was exactly at the adjacent facet. So probably, you know, because at the, uh, the instrumented last level and the non-instrumented level, and the degeneration was just in between. So this was probably due to the additional loads that are you know, being uh, effective or not. So when seeing these results, as I said, this is not 100%, there is some degeneration still. On, it's only one or two discs, but there is degeneration. So what we thought was, let's examine our results according to the complications we get with this BBT surgery. So what are the complications we have is broken tethers, overcorrections, and implant-related complications. And then as the reoperations, we can have tether releases and conversion diffusion. So this line here shows us the follow-up MRI that we get and what happens afterwards. So we had one broken tether before and five broken tethers after. 
And for overcorrection, we had five before and one after. So what does this show us is that, so overcorrection is something, you know, that actually might, you know, re release, uh, might, might actually, you know, in, uh, put too much pressure on the discs. And this overcorrection has already occurred before we have taken the MRI. So after the MRI, there were no more overcorrections. So this means that, you know, when we took the MRI, there were still, you know, already too much load. And looking at the broken tether, so not all of the tethers that were eventually going to break were broken. So still, again, there were a lot of pressure on the disc. And the discs were released, you know, due to tether breakage after we took the MRI. So this is why, you know, the finding with overcorrection and broken tether and the timing they, you know, occurred. We think that this two-year two result is very early, but it might be reflecting a little longer because of the, the way the complications have, you know, have timing according to when we took the MRI. So for the longer follow-up, I'll only show you one case. So we have a lot of more uh, patients with a longer follow-up, but I'll show you one case. So this was our actually first case. And uh, a funny story, we actually didn't know that there were other, imp that, that there were two types of implant, one with an open tulip, and one with a closed tulip. And actually we ordered the wrong, the wrong set of instruments for this first case, and it was a closed tulip. So it was really tough for us to, you know, put the tether in, yeah. uh, but still, you know, uh, this was a success. And eight years later, she is still, you know, doing great. Uh, she was a Sanders tree to start with, very, very little curve. You know, when we talked about her for the VVT and she was going to be the first patient outside US, first patient in Europe, first patient in Turkey. So she was willing to accept the uh, undergo surgery. And eight years later, she looks perfect. And this is her pre-op five years and eight years. So still all the discs are shining. It looks good. So um, I think this is, this is, you know, pretty much our experience. Um, let's see, you know, what's going to happen in 10 years and 15 years and more. Have you noticed any um, difference between um, thoracic discs versus lumbar discs in terms of uh, your data? Yeah, so this is, I think, a great question, which I don't have an answer to, because, you know, um, we started the thoracolumbar tethering almost two, two and a half years later than we started the thoracic ones. So this is why actually we have less and less data on those ones. And, uh, but, you know, we are also working on that, but I don't know if the results are going to be similar or different yet. Yeah. Now, yeah, earlier you mentioned that you don't know if, because um, there's so many unknowns, it's this new procedure, um, but you don't know whether or not autofusion or no autofusion is a good thing. Can you expand on that a little bit more, perhaps? Well, so the thing is, let's say selective thoracic fusion for this patient or a, for a different patient. We know that, you know, the mobility that we have most of the time that we need in our, you know, day-to-day -day exercises, everyday activities is the lumbar one. So the Thoracic flexibility is still important if you are willing to do, you know, some backflips or other stuff like that. If you are a professional volleyball player, it might be important for you. But for many of us who just, you know, go to work, come back, do, you know, some couch exercises only <laughs> watching TV, maybe the thoracic flexibility is not that important, right? So in those cases, uh, maybe a selective thoracic fusion might be a good alternative to a selective thoracic VBT, right? So this is why I'm telling you that, you know, if this is going to autofuse in 20 years, maybe it might spare us a fusion surgery instead of, you know, having three, four, five levels of breakage 
and a reoperation, maybe autofusion might be a good thing. But at least, you know, according to our data, it doesn't seem to occur. And the other thing is how autofusion is going to happen, right? If it's going to happen naturally, it's something else. But if it's going to happen through degeneration, then it's something else. So I have one case, which is not our case, but this was a, a case that asked us uh, for a second opinion and who had a thoracic VBT surgery, just like the one that I showed you, but with disc incisions in the apex. So after the disc incisions, the patient had some pain over the uh, tethered segment. So they had a CT and, a, and an MRI. So this is how it looks. So this is the CT, this is the MRI. So you can see some of the discs that are not incised here that still have the viability, but the ones that are in between, they are black discs. And then on the CT, you can see some degeneration and autofusion. So this was not the autofusion that I was saying that it might be a good thing. I was just saying that, you know, through time, it may get a little bit more stiff and it's not going to, you know, break the tether anymore. But if it's going to be something like that with a degeneration and, and pain, then definitely this is not something that we want to ha happen over time. So there's a difference between the autofusion naturally and an autofusion with incision in terms Probably, of yes. So this is, all of these are theories, I think. Yeah, for sure. But, uh, but I, I suppose if you induce early degeneration by, you know, uh, doing some, you know, releases in the facet or disc or, you know, other soft tissues, uh, let's say internal thoracoplasties, you know, because all of these heal with, you know, fibrosis. And so this is, I think, something different than doing a minimal invasive surgery with, you know, no uh, harm on the discs and no additional procedures to the, you know, facet joints or the, uh, or the ribs or whatever. And if it's getting stiffer over time due to, because this is a, as you said this, what we are doing here is relative stabilization. So it's not stable, but it's not as flexible as before, right? All the data, the bending data and everything shows that there is a relative stability due to the tether itself. So this relative stability maybe over the long run is going to cause some stiffness, uh, which we don't know yet if it does or not. But I think it's something different than induced early degeneration and autofusion. Just a follow-up question. With that patient you had with the incised disc, the pain was from the facet joints impacting or was it, was it from the disc uh, nerve impingement or? Well, I, I don't think that there was something wrong with the nerves. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't like a radiating pain. It was just over the uh, instrumented area, uh, but, I don't know, it's just very hard to say whether it's due to the facets or the discs. Uh, maybe we can know the answer with doing some you know, injections. You could do some facet injection and see if it's improving or not, but which is something that we didn't do for this case. Uh, but I think it was just a, like a more generalized pain uh, over the, over the uh, surgical segment. But probably I assume that it was more related to the uh, to the disc degeneration, uh, but this is just because of the changes I see in the CT and MRI that the facet joints still look uh, healthier than how the discs look. So probably it was due to discs for this particular case, but I don't know. I don't have a, a exact evidence for that. So at your center, um, you don't do any uh, disc releases then? You basically... We haven't done any yet. I don't, I don't think that we will do. Uh, because, you know, if, uh, if you need to do all these, you know, additional, you know, surgical actions to get the correction, um, maybe the patient is not a good candidate for 
for this you know growth modulation and neon fusion surgery as i shown you with the case earlier with 82 degrees so you, we could get her down to 36 without any releases so if that's the case then you know it's a it's a goal for us but if if that patient banded down to 55 and we had to do some releases to get down to 36 at least currently uh, we are not you know uh, doing such such thing but I don't know what the long run data will show us, but currently we think that you know VBT is a way to change the patient is growing, and to do that we have to be very meticulous, you know, uh, really minimally invasive. Not just minimally invasive by doing small incision. It's not just what you do on the skin. It's also what you do inside, how you treat the muscles, you know, how you treat the discs and everything. So for us today, still VBT is a uh, is a minimally invasive surgery, and it's just uh, trying to change the way the patient grows. Uh, just one follow up: if um, if a pre op uh, disc is already quite degenerated, perhaps that's not a good candidate for for tethering. Would it well, be? Would it be yeah. um, a, would it be a candidate for incision of the disc if it's already degenerated? Sorry for asking all these questions. <laughs> but no, no, no. These are really good questions, but tough ones to answer uh, because I don't know if I have the answer yet, right? So mm -hmm. I only have the two cases I've shown you. One with a higher degeneration, which didn't further degenerate and one with a moderate degeneration, which further degenerated. So, and I don't know any other examples. So it's really tough for me to say that, you know, if you have previous degeneration, you can or can't do VBT, or now that you still, have, you have already degeneration, it's okay to incise the disc or not. So I think, you know, these are uh, some, you know, spots that we really don't have enough, you know, scientific evidence on. So I guess this is still for us, even if the patient has a previous degenerated disc, we wouldn't go on and incise uh, the disc uh, just to get, you know, slightly further correction. Uh, because, you know, I am okay to end up with 12 degrees, but I am okay to end up with 25 degrees also, right? So overemphasizing the correction, I think is something that's, you know, inside us, for the years and years of spine surgery that we have done with fusion, because when you do the fusion and it's the final result, you know, the closer you get to zero, the closer you get to the midline, you know, the better the correction it was, you know, it was better for the surgeon, like, you know, this is the perfect thing that I did for the, for the case. So I think this, this is an illusion a little bit, you know, for VBT. For VBT, I think the mentality is not to get to the perfect correction, but it's to get to a sweet spot where it's not going to break, and but still it's not going to overcorrect. Or, or maybe you know we are also discussing that maybe minus five degrees of overcorrection might be a good thing for you know uh, for some patients, but you know we are just willing to get a, a durable construct over the years that we don't need to do a second operation, whether it's a second VBT surgery or, or a fusion surgery. Uh, but, you know, I think the initial COB and the final COB is, is probably of a little bit less importance. Uh, of course, I wouldn't want to end up with a 45 degree or 35 degree curve, but uh, I think 12 and 20 are not too different in this case. Since we're on that uh, tangent, uh, from the studies I'm reading, it seems that with BBT corrections are on average, maybe about 45 to 55 degree, or 45 to 55%. Yeah. And uh, which is great because if you're getting down to 25 or 20, you know, that's really good enough with uh, everything else considered. Are you finding that to be the case with your patients as well? Yeah, I, I think so. So the, the thing is, 
So whenever we want to do a study, for this is true for everybody, not just Ahmed and me. The best thing that the you know the uh, journals are willing to do is more patients and more follow up, right? They only care about how many patients and how long you follow them up. So actually, you know, as I've shown you today with the Sanders one patient or with other patients, that some of our earlier cases are not the ones that we think are the best candidates or that the best correction we did. So this is, you know, we can refer it to as the learning curve, right? So if we exclude, you know, some of the initial cases that we did, then the, follow, then the results would be different, of course, but then we would have less patience and less follow-up. So this is, I think, a dilemma for, for everybody is that, you know, the latter cases are better in sense of patient selection and correction strategy, but the earlier cases are having more follow-up. So most of the things that you see in the literature right now are actually earlier cases. So the complication rates are high, the breakages are high, overcorrection too much, but we are not doing the same surgery today. So I think, you know, this is going to evolve over time. Also, the you know initial correction percentages is going to evolve, and the uh, and the percentage of complications I think is going to evolve. Those are great points. Everything evolves over time, and so do the results. Yeah. Dr. Uh, regarding the anterior approach, do you perform only minimally invasive? Microscopic approach for thoracic tethers, or do you also use a large mini open approach with a larger incision? And if so, why? And as a follow up to that, two additional questions. Can you talk about your recent research, which looks at long term pulmonary outcomes uh, when you're comparing different anterior approaches? And do you use mini open for lumbar tethers? I think you do. I think most do, but you can talk about that as well. Yeah. So just like I said, you know, for the previous question with the disc health, you know, this was something that since day one, you know, we were willing to answer what's going to happen to the pulmonary function test. And the main mentality for that is because why did we change to posterior only surgery in the first place? Because of, you know, most of the results were showing that the pulmonary functions of the anterior spinal fusion was, you know, less favorable compared to posterior spinal fusion. And, you know, simultaneously, we were getting all these, you know, improvements with the pedicle screws and everything. So, you know, both because of the, you know, changing trends of the implants and also due to the results of the pulmonary functions, we switched to posterior only. And then when we were starting to do you know, VBT back to anterior, you know, when we, even before we did the first case, we were discussing with Ahmed, you know, what's going to happen with the pulmonary functions. So since day one, we were, you know, collecting pulmonary function tests pre-op and at different time points in the post-operative. And uh, we do the surgery thoracoscopically and we don't do the thoracoscopy ourselves. We do it with a thoracoscopic surgeon and actually, we consulted them as well. We, we asked them, you know, what does your literature say about the pulmonary functions, right? You are doing more and more cases than we do every year. And the funny thing was, so they start, they already stopped discussing about, you know, open versus, you know, thoracoscopic, like decades ago. Now they are discussing in their literature, if you do three different, you know, portals, compared to two portals. They are discussing, you know, two portal versus one portal and the effect of that on the pulmonary functions in the long term. So for us, this was a, you know, pretty convincing thing that it should be all thoracoscopic. And uh, because, you know, if you do an incision, if you do a thoracotomy, then actually I don't think that it's really mattering, you know, the size of the incision. If it's a mini or a midi incision or a maxi incision, I think the real difference is, at least, you know, this is not just what I think, but this is what I read from the literature is that 
you know, if you put the retractor there and if you retract, then it's something different than if you use the portals. So for us, uh, VBT has always been a old thoracoscopic surgery. Even in the revision cases that we did for tether, you know, releases or removals, uh, we did, you know, old thoracoscopic again. Uh, we are always prepared to, you know, switch to open uh, if needs be, if something goes wrong. But we haven't done any uh, until now. But for the torcolumbar incision, for the flank incision, of course we do the we do the open technique retroperitoneal. Uh, but for L1 and sometimes in some cases for L2, we still try to go through the the toracoscopic incision instead of having another incision outside. Uh, we try to, you know, dig under the diaphragm and, you know, put the, put the screws there. Uh, but for, for many other cases, if you are going down to L3 or L4, we just do a separate incision. So um, I think we did, you know, two, two main studies on these. And the first one was on the harm study group database. So we presented this uh, last year at several meetings. And it was actually a big cohort of 352 patients. Most of them were female. So there were 43 patients with a VBT and then anterior spinal fusion and posterior spinal fusion with two years follow-up. And uh, the follow-up PFTs were at two and a half, five years on average. It goes to from two years to seven years post-op. But on average, you know, the PFTs are belonging to two and a half years. So what we have found in this study was, so here you see the VBT, here you see anterior spinal fusion, and here you see posterior spinal fusion. And here is the zero point, which is actually your, you know, uh, normalized starting PFT. And then if you go up, it means you are improving your results. If you go down, it means that you are, you know, uh, you are decreasing in the pulmonary function tests. And if you don't see any numbers on top, as in these cases, then it means that the change is not statistically significant. So it's just basically the same. But if you see the numbers, then this is a statistically significant change. So when we just look at the three groups, but then we'll look at the subgroups as well. But if you just look at the three main groups of VBT and posterior spinal fusion, they are, you know, pulmonary function neutral, let's say, but anterior spinal fusion is declining the pulmonary functions. But then if we go into more detail into subgroups, what we have shown was if you do VBT in a video assisted thoracoscopic surgery compared to open, you know, video assisted or video not assistant thoracoscopy, then what we see was VBT with a slightly open incision, you know, seems to decline a little bit, which is, you know, not statistically significant for this case series. But on the other hand, if you do thoracoscopically, you actually improve, which is significant. And then the thing is, you know, these two, they average to this result, right? So actually, you know, this result with VBT of 43 patients is actually a combination of 24 that were done thoracoscopically, which improved, and then 19 that were done in an open fashion, which non-significantly, you know, slightly declined in numbers. So it means that basically it was pretty much the same to where you started. And then if you look at the anterior spinal fusion where we say that, you know, it's declining, if you look into more details, if you do the anterior spinal fusion thoracoscopically, then you don't see that decline. But if you see the anterior thoracoscopic fusion in an open way, which is again, you know, 83 patients here and 43 page, 42 patients here, actually this overall result is because of the open cases, but not the video assisted, you know, thoracoscopic, all thoracoscopic cases. And if we go to more detail for posterior spinal fusion, if you just do posterior spinal fusion, then it's, you know, no change. But if you do posterior spinal fusion and add a thoracoplasty, then you decline your pulmonary functions. 
very interesting. Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. With um, DBT and uh, with the mini open versus the anterior spinal fusion and the mini open, what's the difference in terms of, um, is it a bigger incision for the anterior spinal fusion? Uh, can, you, can you go into detail a little bit more about the difference between the two? So video assisted thoracoscopy means that you don't have a retractor. So you do not actually retract the ribs away or you don't, you know, uh, do thoracoplast to remove. Uh, you only go for a small incision, but I don't think it's because of the size of the incision, but you go with a, with a port and you know the ports have, you know, uh, like, like blades. So you go through with less damage, I think, to the, uh, to the surface. I don't know why it's happening. But when you do an open, regardless of the size of your incision, you use a retractor. And then actually the main difference is that, you know, with open, you can see with your bare eyes, you know, what's going on inside the chest. But in, in the video assisted, you know, the ports are not allowing you to see anything. So you only have to see through the, through the camera. So I don't know what actually is creating the difference. Is it because of the fibrosis? Is it it's because of this or that? Um, I don't know if the, the thoracic cage, you know, the mechanics of how we breathe is affected or not. Uh, but this is, this is the results. And this is pretty much similar in VBT and ASF, anterior spinal fusion, is that if you do a thoracotomy, then it looks like there is more effect on the pulmonary functions than if you do it you know, uh, fully with the portals. And a similar example for posterior spinal fusion is that if you don't touch the you know, thoracic cage at all, the results are different than if you do a thoracoplasty and change the mechanics of the, of the thoracic cage. Dr. Yelgar, I know uh, this is a two-year mean outcome. Uh, for the patients who you've seen up to seven years, uh, have you and have done uh, surgeries with a retractor? Have those um, numbers stay, pulmonary function numbers stay low or have they come back or have you seen any yeah. of that way? So the, the problem there is, so let me go to the next slide. And so this is 43 patients, right? I think this is the main problem. To answer all these you know, detailed questions is getting really tough because what we did here was actually divide these. So it's, it might be a little small, but actually what we did was we actually divided this 24 and this 19 patients into further groups according to where we did the surgery. So the first one on the top is only thoracic, which means that we didn't touch the diaphragm. And here below you see the thoracolumbar which is, so you have something above the diaphragm and you have something below the diaphragm. So you had to go, you know, through the diaphragm. And then here down below, we have the double curves or double-sided surgery. So it means that you operated this lung and then you operated that lung as well. So you deflated both lungs. And here now, you know, you can see that, you know, there's eight patients here, four patients here, four patients here, only two patients here and seven patients here. So it's not big numbers. So this is why we don't have any p-values around here because it's not because it is whether it's significant or not, but just because we don't have the numbers to say whether it's significant or not. But you know, the trend shows us that, you know, even if you do it open, if you just, you know, if you don't touch the diaphragm, the, diff the results might be different than if you do both lungs or if you do, you know, cross the diaphragm. And this is also true for, you know, uh, for the thoracoscopic. So the result here compared to this one and compared to this one, so it's not as, you know, uh, it's only two patients here. So we don't, we cannot say for sure but it seems to be different. If you touch the diaphragm, the results might be different. Or if you do both lungs, the result might be slightly different. And we can also look more on this. Uh, and this is also, again, for the open uh, thoracic and open thoracoabdominal as well. So 
So the final result of this, you know, harm study group study that we did was that probably the results of your pulmonary function is dependent on the technique, it's dependent on the approach, and it's also dependent on where you are doing the surgery. Is it on the thoracic cage? Is it both? Is it on both sides? And in general, VBT, uh, video assisted, you know, thoracoscopic anterior spinal fusion and posterior spinal fusion seems to preserve the pulmonary function. But if you add thoracotomies or if you do open incisions, then you might get some deterioration. So on a follow-up to this, what we did was a similar study, but this was our own data now. And actually last year, this got the Louis Goldstein Award from the SRS. Uh, so this was 54 patients with again, two and a, two and a half years follow-up. And uh, th this was again, a growing group of patients. They grew six centimeters on average. And what we have seen was actually there were 11% of pulmonary complications there were atelectasis, there were pleural efficients, there were chylothorax, and there were readmissions for these two cases, but no reinterventions. So, but despite these complications, so the results we get. So up here you see the thoracic, here you see the thoracolumbar, and here you see the double. So what happens for the thoracic only? So we have the means here and we have the medians again. So we have 38 patients here, six here and nine here. So what we see from pre-op to, to, to one year is as you can see with the P values, this is a significant improvement. So the patient goes from 80 to 87 in the mean or 78 to 86 in the median. So in the first year, the thoracic patients improve. And then what happens in two years was P is not significant. So it means no change. So there seems to be a more improvement again. So 86 to 92, 85 to 90, but this change was not significant, but it looks like there's a trend of improvement in the thoracic and in the thoracolumbar from pre-op to one year, no change. And in the double curve from pre-operative to two, one year, no change. So is this, you know, uh, study got the, you know, uh, Louis Goldstein Award, what we thought was, let's do a follow-up this year. Let's do, you know, more results. And actually what we added was number of patients, but also we added time of follow-up. So now instead of having, you know, 38, six and nine, now we have 50, 10 and 13. So we have more cases. And now we have one year. Now we have two to three years. And now we have four to five years as well. So this is to be presented. So this is accepted to several uh, uh, of the Congress's meetings this year, but this is still to be published. But what we have seen was an improvement in the first year. And as I told you in the previous study, we have seen a trend in the second year, but it was not significant. But now you can see at two years and at five years, now it's significant. So actually what we have shown that if you do a VBT with only thoracoscopic approach, you know, no open incision, no diaphragm dissection, then, you know, you can improve up to five years your pulmonary function results. And on the thoracolumbar, which is including the diaphragm and on the double curve, what's happening is no change and then no change. And here, no change and then no change. So it means that it's not deteriorating, but it's not improving as well, but it's just preserving for the latter two groups. But for this first group, we see an improvement. Thanks for sharing that scoop. That's excellent. What, what's your feeling in terms of why is there improving pulmonary function with the thoracic VBT? Uh, well, I think, you know, scoliosis itself you know it gets you some uh, deterioration in the pulmonary function so it might not be clinically significant you may still you know run up the stairs because you are still you know 12 years old 13 years old right you are very young but if you do a pulmonary function test 
I can show that's a decline compared to your peers who don't have scoliosis. But when we do the surgery and we don't, you know, change the way the thoracic dynamics are working, but with time, you get correction of your care due to modulation of growth. I think this is what's, you know, improving your results. Actually, you know, as you can see, how, what to what degrees are you improving is actually your expected results. So you go back to, you know, 9,700 means that you are at the level of your expected compared to you started with, you know, some 80 degrees, some 80%. So it's not actually improving something, but it's actually, you know, regaining you, you know, what you have lost and it's bringing you, let's say, back to, you know, in, in brackets, back to normal. I understand. Uh, it makes total sense. You, you mean the correction and primarily the correction of coronal plane that's perhaps uh, moderating the rib function, or are you also looking at the, you know, anterior posterior chest diameter with kyphosis maybe that's also improving? You really have tough questions. <laughs> You're welcome. So, uh, so this is actually a great question. So I think it should, from all the things that we know from the previous literature, it should have something to do with the sagittal plane correction as well. Uh, but what we have seen in our data and all, all the other data that have been published so far is that VBT is not really having a big effect on the you know, sagittal plane correction. But still, you know, so I can ask you two questions. So on which levels do you measure the coronal cove angle? And the answer is, it depends, right? It depends on the curve. So if the curve is here, you measure it here. If the curve is there, you measure it there. If the curve is there, you measure it there. But on which levels do you measure the sagittal plane? It's always the same. You measure T2 to T12, T5 to T12 on every case, regardless of where their coronal curve is. So I think this creates us some bias into what we are measuring in the sagittal plane. Because as we know from adult surgery, that the distribution of lordosis is very important. What's going on in the lower arc, what's going on in the upper arc is different. So I think this is pretty much the same for the scoliosis as well. So what's going on in the lower thoracic area, what's going on in the upper thoracic area are different. And we know that patients can do compensation to tolerate some deformity that they have. They do a reciprocal you know, change in the compensation. So what we believe and what we are working on now is that although the overall kyphosis might look the same, if you look at different segments of kyphosis, you can see that we are changing some things with the VBT and this might be uh, giving us some improvements that the literature is currently saying that it's not really changing, but probably the shape is changing, not the total magnitude, but the shape of the uh, kyphosis might be changing. But we'll see what the data shows <laughs> in the long run. Final question, Dr. Yodor. Um... How has BBT, your experience with BBT, affected how you treat scoliosis patients today? So this is another uh, great question, Derek, thank you. Um, so the answer to that is actually, I think, what, it, what VBT made us think is that, you know, there are some theories on how scoliosis grows, right? There is the mechanical theory. There is the neuromuscular theory. There is the you know, uh, theory around the hormones and all the others. So the thing was that you know, we always thought uh, that the mechanical theory is having an effect in the progression, but not actually in the initiation of the, of the disease. But actually, when we have seen that we are able to change how scoliosis is you know improving after vbt surgeries it made us you know be more and more fans of the mechanical theory so this is now 
affecting the way we see our patients. So how so? How come? So this is, I think it's more about the spinal loading and growth. So we know that the growth depends on the loads acting on the growth plates. So in these examples of the Padang woman, you know, where they wear the neck rings, they apply distractive forces and they are able to get, you know, to tremendous amounts of neck length so they can overgrow. And in the example of the foot binding, what other can do is apply compressive forces and then gets let, less growth. So this is the hutter volkmann law saying that, you know, if, they, if you apply compressive and destructive forces on growth plates, you can change the amount they grow. And this is actually, you know, what we are doing with VBT. And the other, you know, uh, theory around this is the Stokes vicious cycle, right? So when you have your midline here and you have compressive forces here, what happens is you get wedging of the vertebra, which goes into curvature, asymmetric loading, more asymmetric growth, and then this keeps on as a, as a vicious cycle. So what we do uh, actually, you know, with VBT is actually, here is the compression, here is the distraction, and this is where the wedging is. And what we do with VBT is actually we change the compressive and distractive sides, right? And when you change those sides, you break the vicious cycle and the growth asymmetry goes into growth modulation. And this has been shown by other colleagues that in six weeks, the concave and convex you know, proportion of a vertebra can actually change in one year. So the growth modulation that we are talking about is most of the time it means the change in curve magnitude. But actually there is another modulation which happens within each vertebra to the shape, right? So seeing all these, it took us back to the basics and we thought, you know, if this can be done, can we also do it with the other methods? And as we just, you know, talked about the scoliosis specific exercises and the bracing, we thought if this is possible with non-operative treatment methods as well. So because the mentality here is to change the way the compressive and distractive forces are applying, right? So if we can do this with the brace or with the 3D you know, corrective exercises, can we achieve similar results? So with the bracing, we use the Rigo Chenot braces that they are called you know, four dimensions because the three dimensions are in the axial, coronal, and sagittal planes, yes, but the fourth dimension is the breathing mechanics. As you keep on breathing, you get you know, more correction uh, of your scoliosis. So then uh, my question to you is, so we know that you know, scoliosis is happening in three planes, right? It's on the coronal, it's on the axial, and it's on the sagittal. But can you tell me the chronological, chronological order in which these occur, which one happens first and then the next and then the next one, which is the initiator in, in regards to what we know from the literature today? It's confusing because there's uh, not, there's no consensus, as you know. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, some feel it's, uh, it starts with rotation. Some, uh, some feel it's the, the posterior uh, shear loads on the discs yes. cause the rotation, but it's it's coupled anyway at the at the end, right? But definitely it's not the coronal, right? The coronal happens the last. This is consensus. Yes. So okay. so this this might be one, two, three, or as you say, it might be one, two, three. So we believe more in this one. Uh, at least you know the the evidence that we have seen in the literature, I think points more to the sagittal plane being the initiator. Uh, but definitely coronal plane is not. So what we did next was we said, okay, these are compressive and distractive forces and we can change it with VBT. Can we also change it with a brace? If we apply enough forces, can we really change how the patient grows? And 
it seems like, you know, the answer might be yes, at least for a group of patients. And due to the fact that, you know, we think that the axial and sagittal plane is more important and the literature is also showing that the results of the good bracing is depending on the axial correction most of the time. What we did was uh, we applied the principles of the gap score. As you know, we are the uh, first and the last authors of the you know uh, adult gap score paper as well. We applied the principles of the gap paper, the sagittal plane, to scoliosis principles as well, and so we did a Rigocheno brace, which works with the sagittal plane, uh, which works with the breathing mechanics. Sorry, but we also add the sagittal plane correction. So this is a thirty-seven degree curve with great coronal correction. I think also great rotational correction, as you can see in this image, but also sagittal plane correction as well. And with time, if you look at the relative spinopelvic alignment, relative lumbar lordosis and relative pelvic version within the gap score, as we have seen that this patient is gone from, you know, way off than its normals, close to the normal. And then when the sagittal plane change occurs through March, August, November, and May, this is what we see in the coronal plane. So we were actually growth modulating, you know, with a, you know, non-operative, you know, device, right? So this is a combination of uh, bracing and exercises. So I can show you, I think up to today, we have more than 100 cases now, you know, uh, but uh, I'll only sh I'll only show you a couple of them. So this one is a curve that's you know diagnosed early, good the rotational brace, and then this is the final result after weaning. So another case again diagnosed very early, and you can see here this is what we call an overcorrection brace. So the patient has a curve that goes to the left side. But you can see that in the brace, it's slightly to the right side, right? So there is slight overcorrection to the other side. And then this is post weaning one year. So now that we have seen this, what we thought was let's go crazy, right? Let's do more crazy stuff. So this is an eight year old over 60 degrees. And she is not a very good candidate for VBT because she is eight. She will definitely overcorrect. You could do growing rods, or you could wait, or you could do this, or you could do that. And you can see from the rib hump how derotated she is. But what we thought, as we have seen that she is very flexible, we did the brace and exercise. And this is how she has evolved over three years. And this is so she's 11 now. So we still have, you know, a lot of growth left. And this is 42 degrees now. So this is still, you know, a surgical candidate. But as you can see from the rib hump here in the sagittal plane image, we definitely derotated. We definitely changed the sagittal plane and we definitely changed the coronal plane. So this patient might still go on and be a surgical candidate at the end, but at least we grew her from eight to 11 now with the brace. And, and, and exercises. And here again, there's another example of a toracolumbar curve now. So I've always shown you thoracic cases, uh, but this is a toracolumbar curve, big curve, modulated. And this is also, you know, what we used was two braces, one with an overcorrection, one with a neutral correction. And this one she sleeps with, this one she wears during school. And this is the final result. So my last case example for you is about the thing that we have talked about the integration of different methods. So this is a patient that we have seen with a double curve, which we thought that might need a double VBT. But then we decided on putting her on a brace, which is focused more on the lumbar curve. And now what we did was you can see from this to this, that the lumbar curve has evolved, but not the thoracic curve. Actually, the thoracic curve got bigger, 
but the lumbar curve was slightly better. Then we did a only thoracic, you know, VVT for this patient and nothing to the to the lumbar curve. So now we are trying to use all these, you know, scoliosis specific exercises, bracing and VVT, pre-op, post-op in combination. You know, we can change, we can switch. We can do a VVT and then do a post op bracing or the other way around or stuff like that. So this is what we think about, you know, growth modulation and you know uh, mechanical theory as of today. Right. So it's uh, trying to growth modulate through every phase, really. Yeah. I think I'll have to, one day I'll have to visit your facility and you have to give me a grand tour. <laughs> that was amazing. Yeah. I, I would love that. Yeah. That'll be this. It'll be so much fun. Now, question for you is that um, I love the idea of the bracing, and I love the idea of the double bracing as well. Different brace for a night when you're when you're supine, uh, different brace when you're vertical. Um, okay. But I always thought there was a uh, inverse relationship between, uh, for instance, um, flattening of the sagittal curves and rotation. So, for instance, if you have thoracic hypokyphosis or even thoracic lower doses. And if you try to derotate too much, that makes it worse. Is that correct or am I wrong? And, how, and if so, how do you try and correct a thoracic hypokyphosis or lower doses? So actually this is the breathing mechanics. So as you can see here, if you are not breathing in, every derotational, you know, correction is of course hypokyphosing. But as you can see, as she breathes, so the the kyphosis restoration in these cases are dynamic. Uh, if you don't have enough room, as in you know, as in this example for derotation. And as in this example for kyphosis, it's not going to work. So we are not actually derotating and locking them in a derotated position in the hypokyphosis. So the derotation is also happening with the breathing mechanics. And with that, kyphosis restoration. And also the coronal correction slightly as well is also improving with the kyphosis. And also, you know, with this example, as I shown you here, when the hypokyphosis is not up here, but in the torical lumbar junction, then you can actually, you know, slightly kyphose the patient right in the brace without the, uh, without the breathing mechanics. But, you know, uh, with the breathing mechanics, then it happens, uh, you know, over time. Okay. So for... I guess th there's limitations for everything. Yeah, sure. <laughs> and uh, I guess there's a subset of um, you know patients who are have really, are really very hyp hypokyphotic, if not thoracic lower dotic, and are stiff into flexion as well. Uh, those seem to be the, some of the toughest patients because they resist sagittal correction, sagittal plane correction, and they resist uh, coronal plane correction. How do you, those sound actually like more of a fusion approach to try and correct different planes, right? Yeah, sure. I think, you know, the limitations to, you know, VVT and the limitations to bracing are, you know, pretty much similar. You know, if, if they are really, frankly, lordotic or really hypokyphotic and it's a stiff hypokyphosis, uh, then I think it's really tough to treat them with a VBT or with brace as well. So I think those cases might be a better uh, candidate for for fusion with a, with a kyphosis restoration focus. Absolutely. Okay. Dr. Bilgore, thanks so much for uh, your presentation and thanks for going through all the uh, all the work. That uh, learned a lot and uh, I really, really appreciate your time. Do you have any uh, last words you'd like to say? So I just want to, you know, thank you. Uh, so this was a great opportunity and, and the topics you have chosen 
the main topics were really great. And after that, you know, the questions that you asked, you know, within the presentation were, I think, you know, really uh, to the point that, you know, this was a great discussion. And um, I hope, uh, you know, the weavers will also enjoy and, you know, uh, hopefully they will learn one or two things. Oh, they'll, they'll learn more than one or two things. That's for sure. <laughs> All right. Thanks again for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you.